Greetings, this is J.R. Dickey. Thanks for tuning in to our podcast. And by the way, don't forget our website, graceandtruth.net. I hope you're having a great day, but if not, hang with me. It's about to get better. Okay, today we're going to talk about life. No, not yours or mine, just the nature of life itself. Okay, let's get started. The typical wide-brim Chinese hat he wears is wrapped in ancient plastic wrap and shades of face that is aged and downcast. Pushing his broom to clean the trashy streets, he stands or rather stoops in a surreal contrast to the flashy, young, and sensuous billboards, 30 feet high, advertisements for Esprit, Top Girl, Totally Jojo, and the hundreds of other false boastings of a modern materialistic world, which is quiet now, but only a few hours earlier was bustling with crowds of people, shopping, flirting, seeking gain. I gently wagged my head and thought, what a life. Life, I don't think we really get it. I don't think we really understand what life truly is. In fact, this example comes to mind. As the actors beheld a beautiful sunset and drank their beer, the old commercial used to say, it don't get any better than this. And many people think of life in such terms. Clearly, the overwhelming majority think of life as the pursuit of pleasure. In fact, it's common when we're stuck in an unpleasurable routine to hear someone say, hey, get a life. But life is not primarily biological. It's just that biology, so to speak, the physical world and its values, are easier for us to deal with, to perceive and identify. Neither is life simply existence. You and I will exist forever, but we know that eternal existence will be either eternal life or eternal death. So there's another more fundamental quality of life to consider. And I don't think we really get it, but we should definitely try. The Apostle Paul admonished the early church, saying, quote, You should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles, that is, unbelievers, walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God. That's Ephesians chapter 4. The very fact that he made this statement, the very fact that he made this statement shows that we as believers can have the same misunderstanding about life as unbelievers. So what is life, really? And why does it matter? To the one who has never tasted the goodness of God, never been born again through Christ, any attempt to communicate this will make no sense. It will be like describing the most incredible sunset to someone born blind. The author, Randy Alcorn, in his novel Deadline, put it this way. His character, Finney, is ushered into heaven, and he writes now, The crowd visible beyond the passageway grew with each step he took. Some faces he did not recognize, many others he did. He took the last step, or was it the first, and entered the new world. As he came out the end, or or was it the beginning? Over the threshold, he gasped his first breath of heaven's air. The gasp was a gasp of wonder at the beauty of this place and the magnificence of its inhabitants. Many hands grabbed Finney's, which he stretched out toward them as if to confirm they were real. He must have some sort of body since he could feel their touch. This struck a chord of familiarity. It had happened before, or something very much like it, yes, of course, when he was born into the other world. The passageway had been the birth canal between earth and heaven, and these were the midwives of heaven, supervising his birth, pulling him into the world, fussing over him and proudly presenting him to his new family. This was the real world which he'd been no more capable of imagining before than of an unborn child can imagine the infinite wonders that lie beyond the womb. Now, the Bible uses two terms for what we have translated as life. 
Their meanings are the same in both Greek and Hebrew, the original languages. However, they represent to the discerning heart things that are worlds apart. The first term comes from the word to breathe. It means a breathing creature. In scripture, it always refers to earthly life. A few examples are, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? That's Matthew 6.25. And there's some other examples I'll read here. He who finds his life will lose it, and he who loses his life for my sake will find it. That's Matthew 10.39. As a father knows me, even so I know the father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. That's John 10.15. Okay, that was the first term. Now the second term means life or vitality, and is the word always used in referring to the eternal quality. Here are a few examples from Matthew 7.14. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. And from Luke 12.15. And he said to them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of things he possesses. And from John 1.4. In him, that's Jesus, was life. And the life was the light of men. And John 5.24 Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. Now, Jesus in his great I am statements used this second term to describe himself seven times, twice as much as any other attribute. And God Almighty is specifically referred to as the, quote, living God, over 30 times in Scripture, more than any other descriptor. So clearly, this is of paramount importance. In fact, I'll suggest that it is the theme of God's plan and purpose for man. It was the very thing we forfeited in Eden and the very thing we have restored through the cross of Calvary, life. What happened back in the Garden of Eden? We died. You see, by Adam and Eve, we broke off, detached, separated, became alienated from our Creator. Death is exactly that, separation from God. We say an electrical circuit is dead when it is open or separated from the flow of power. In a similar way, we lost connection with our source, the essence of life. Apart from him, we rot and decay in every way. As a result, what does the world consider to be life? Well, really, it can be summed up in four letters. S-E-L-F. Self-satisfaction, self-gratification, self-absorption, self-realization, self-will, selfishness. Every attribute or quality of what the world thinks of as life is tied to self and thus separated from God. And analogous to the opening scene of My Companion on the early morning streets of Taipei, many of us are generally inclined to consider life just as a spectrum of worldly opportunities ranging from the poor have-nots to the blissful, binging gotta-haves. But in reality, life, real life, is not even on this plane. As we study scripture, it's obvious that the closer you are to the Lord, the more connected, the more intimate, the more life you have. Consider the four creatures immediately surrounding God's throne in heaven. These are the most privileged, created beings of all. And notice what is their common identifier. You can look at Revelation chapter 4. They are living. Could God be any more obvious? You know, in my ignorance, I used to think of these creatures as somewhat robotic or mindless to continually be saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come, when in fact... 
They are just the opposite. Their incredibly outstanding intellect affords them the ability to comprehend, which leads to their awe and in turn leads to their continual worship. Now, I don't think we get it, but we can. We'll get it as we get it. Got it? If you have a loving, believing, submitted relationship with Jesus Christ, eternal life will one day soon stun you with joy indescribable. When you are in His embrace, you will know perfectly that everything is right. Everything. I said everything. I'm not talking about some blissful forgetfulness, but the actual, tangible understanding of truth, the grasping of his accomplished plan. And I'm not talking about some feigned obligatory posture of praise in spite of pain, but an actual overwhelming change and restoration of your spirit, soul, and body, as well as all that pertains to your joy. And I'm not talking about a temporary emotional swing or flirtatious affair with glee, but a completed work, a never fading, always dawning, everlasting, ever expanding gift from God. Moses in the Old Testament put it this way. He simply said, choose life. That is, consciously allow God's Spirit to draw you into the closer, more connected, more intimate relationship with Him. Pursue this course with wild abandon of self. And expect the world to think you're nuts. You have nothing to fear. He's not too busy for you. He'll never leave you. His thoughts about you are without number and are for your good. It's in this relationship and the never-ending pursuit for more of God that we comprehend and enjoy life. We get it. To know Him is to love Him. Is to know Him is to love Him. Is to know Him is to love Him. On and on it goes forever. This is the circle of life. John 17, 3 puts it this way, and this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you sent. Now may the Lord grant you peace in the midst of any storm and faith to trust him. Look for our next podcast, and may you realize more of his grace today.